welcome to the Sword and Laser. I'm Veronica Belmont. <laughs> I'm Tom Merritt. Yeah, Lem was getting a little smoky. Ooh, I told him not to smoke in the space right, castle, but he doesn't listen to me. It smells great, though. Oh, so brimstone. rude. Yeah. It's our author spotlight series. How can a huge bookshelf, a pod castle, and red flowers combine to make an award-winning author? Well, we're going to find out. Let's start by telling you the seven things you should know about Rachel Swirsky. Rachel Swirsky graduated from the University of California at Santa Cruz and received an MFA at the Iowa Writers' Workshop. She's been nominated for the Hugo Award and the World Fantasy Award, among others. And in 2010, she won the Nebula Award for her novella, The Lady Who Plucked Red Flowers Beneath the Queen's Window. She is a founding editor of Podcastle Podcast and is currently the vice president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. She says on her website that her maternal grandfather was an Orthodox Jew, her paternal grandfather was a member of the KKK, her great uncle suffered from an addiction to milk, and her great grandmother was afraid of grass. Among her relatives are screenwriters, poets, physicists, mathematicians, librarians, and engineers. Growing up, Rachel's parents had a huge bookshelf that leaned against their bedroom door filled with science fiction and fantasy paperbacks from Adams to Zelazny. From the top shelf to the ceiling were stacks of old Asimov's magazines. When she wanted something to read, she'd grab Octavia Butler or Anne McCaffrey or Joan Vidge. Maury, from among others, would have been in heaven. Her short fiction has appeared in Weird Tales, Fantasy Magazine, and Subterranean Magazine, among others, and has been collected in Year's Best Anthologies, edited by Rich Horton, Jonathan Strand, and the Vandermeers. Her poem, The Oracle on River Street, won third place for the Riesling Award and was reprinted in the 2008 Riesling Anthology. Rachel also writes essays, reviews, and other nonfiction. So in short, Rachel Swirsky is awesome, but wait, there's more! In Aaron's whiteboard, of course. I was driving to work one day and heard Stephen King being interviewed on NPR. Asked about the future of American letters, he declared that the short story was, effectively, a dead medium. That's going to come as a heck of a surprise to Rachel Swirsky, who has built an astonishing literary career, winning or making the shortlist for the Nebula, the Hugo, the Locus, the Sturgeon, and Tiptree Awards, all in the time since Stephen King finished off The Dark Tower. And she's vice president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, all that on the basis of short stories. The short story format means Swirsky is able to focus on the emotional heart of her tales, like A Memory of Wind, which covers the human side of epic Greek myth, or Eros Philia Agape, a tale of love among the robot classes. Due warning, as this is short fiction, readers should not expect her to pull her punches the way an author of long-term fiction might do to audience investment. Joss Whedon effect is in full force here. And here's the bonus good news. If you're looking for an entree into Swirsky's work, generous samples are freely available from her publisher. It would be hard to say the same for a writer primarily working in the medium of novels, such as, oh, say, Stephen King. So, a defunct medium? I don't think so. Stephen King, of anybody, should know that things which might seem dead often aren't. What does Stephen King know anyway? Ah, viva la short story. Yeah. You know that old adage, right? I, that is an ancient adage. Some of the best short stories are undead short stories. <laughs> okay, that was a different adage than the That's one I the thought one. you were. You were thinking okay. of the other one. Yeah. Hey, you know, the best way to learn more about Rachel Swirsky is to ask an actual Rachel Swirsky. So let's do that. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Rachel. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, you, like us, are, are, podcast, are a podcaster. You have some experience in this field, and yes. uh, I've been checking out Podcastle quite a bit. Why do you think Podcastle is something, or podcasting in general, is so great for disseminating fiction? Well, um, when I was running Podcastle, and it has been a little bit of time, um, one thing that we found was just there's an enormous audience of people who aren't going to pick up a magazine or a book, but will you know, put on a podcast. It's something that they can fit very easily into their schedules that goes with uh, how they think of their lives. And so there would be, you know, 18,000 listeners for Escape Pod, even while some of the big magazines were struggling to keep that many subscribers. And they were non-overlapping pools. And, and people like audiobooks, so it makes sense that they would like yeah. podcast stories as well. Yeah. yeah. Sort of like being, you know, being read to it yeah. may hit some of those buttons that your mom or dad hit when you were a kid. 
And also, we're, we're a little sad because Pseudopod keeps beating us for a Parsec <laughs> Award. So well. someday, someday, we'll get there. One of these days. <laughs> One of these days. Uh, now, you're also doing extensive work as the Vice President of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. Do, do we call you Madam Vice President? Is there a title? Uh, you can. Then we, we will call you Madam Vice President. Uh, has Mary Robinette Cole's spirit been guiding you in this at all? Mary Robinette Cole has been guiding me. Um, she's amazing. She, um, along with some other people, you know, initially threw the idea in front of me of running. Um, they did uh, actually the year before. They asked me if I wanted to run for secretary, and I said no. But I, I had in my in my heart, you know, just kind of a feeling that I did want to give back to the writing community. And so Mary has been a fantastic help. John Scalzi and Stephen Gould, who is the current president, is amazing. Um, I've been really fortunate to get to meet and work with some of these people. So what exactly is the purpose of the SFWA? Well, it depends on who you ask. Um, it's the closest thing uh, for me that we have to any kind of collective action um, as a group of writers. And because of that, uh, services like our Griefcom that can help writers talk to publishers about um, contracts that are sketchy or payments that haven't been made, um, I think are really important. We don't exactly have a union, but this is our closest way of talking together and having that voice heard. And, and do you feel like that's something, uh, is, is there a way to join that? Is that something that new writers should be looking into? Or is it more of a, is it a looser affiliation? How does one become involved? Well, to join the Science Fiction Writers Association, there is actually a um, profile of qualifications that you need to meet. Um, essentially, just kind of um, uh, outlining that you may become or on your way to becoming a professional writer in the future. Um, for writers who aren't at that stage yet, we do provide some really cool resources, like Writer Beware. And there are lots of uh, CIFWA members who can be reached um, by Twitter or, you know, we're, we're all sort of around social media being enthusiastic. And, um, you know, we're happy to help out new writers as they go, even if they're not quite at the stage yet where they need help with contracts. Uh, well, let's, let's go back to the beginning of your authorial journey, since we're talking about helping people that are be at, at, at the beginning of theirs. How did you get interested in writing? What, what made you want to become an author? Tell us a little bit about your, your, your origin your, story. Your origin story, your journey. There you go, yeah. When my parents were killed in a mugging. Right, of course. Um, well, actually, what I've been uh, giving as, as my origin story is my parents are both science fiction readers. And so they built themselves, you know, bookshelves that are perfectly spaced for paperbacks. There's one right behind their bedroom door that's got like all the Asimovs from like the 70s and 80s on it. That's and so beautiful. I really grew up with science fiction and fantasy and reading in general being a, a really large part of my life. Um, I also grew up doing theater. And so I was sort of headed toward theater as a career until I discovered that that was going to make me absolutely miserable. <laughs> And then I, I uh, sort of switched over majors in college and started heading toward writing. So I've been a very academic writer. A lot of writers have, don't come to it through a workshop or college pathway, but I did. And I'm hoping you're less miserable with writing than <laughs> theater. I hope that was, that was, was that the good choice? Yes. yes. So tell us about your latest book collection, your latest short story collection, rather. Um, I am really lucky that it came out with Subterranean Press. They make gorgeous books. And the cover is by Sean Tan. Um, the publisher of Subterranean asked um, my agent who I would want to have do a cover for my book. And he said, Sean Tan. And I was totally floored that they managed to get this gorgeous cover. It's a compilation of um, most of my professionally published or um, year's best included award nominated stories up to the point where I originally sent the collection to Bill, which was a couple years ago at this point. So there are more stories that are not included. Um, and I had really wanted to put it together in a mythic structure, going from the past, the origin of the universe, to kind of the end of the universe. And that's because several years ago I found myself writing these multiple apocalypse stories that would sort of take place in, mm. in different, different kinds of ends of the universe. So that gave me the structure for it and sort of the name. The, so that's the theme that pulls through these stories. And, and did you think of it as a collection as you're writing them? Uh, or is it something you sort of look at afterwards and go, oh, OK, this, is, this looks like a good arrangement? Yeah, it was definitely more like that. It's just it's, a, it's an emergent property of your subconscious, I suppose. As much writing is. Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, now, we haven't really spoken to a lot of authors who, who talk openly about their poetry. Um, and I, meant, <laughs> I noticed that you have, you, you discuss that on your blog. Um, so I was curious, like, it, what about that medium? What about that, that writing style appeals to you? And why don't you think more authors kind of do poetry as, as part of the writing process? Actually, uh, you know, it's, it's surprising to me because I really like working in a lot of types of genres, playwriting. Um, and I'm, I don't, I'm not faithful to science fiction and fantasy. I'm happy to write mainstream or whatever. Um, but a lot of writers really don't move out of their niche, whatever that is. Um, and I think in our culture, we're taught very strongly how to read and understand prose and, and kind of told that poetry is this magical, incomprehensible thing, which it's not. It's just got its own sense, set of reading protocols. But I meet a lot of writers who tell me they just don't understand how poetry works. Hmm. There is actually a vibrant community of science fiction poets emerging at the moment. Um, uh, Kat Malenti is doing some beautiful work, Amal El Matar, Rose Lemberg, um, uh, Lisa Bradley, Nisi Shaw. There's a collection that just came out from Aqueduct Press called Moments of Change. I've moved more away from the poetry, but I'm excited to see that people are still doing it and really having fun with that as a form. I think a lot of readers also have the same uh, befuddlement about poetry that, that you're describing in the authors as well. Is there something you can tell people or a tip you can give them to help them ease their way in and discover poetry and start enjoying it? Um, you know, I mean, you might want to start with some of the poets who are a little bit more accessible to you. And I think the problem is, um, I don't think our English literature classes are usually very good at, at giving students material that's going to be actually relevant to them or their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know why Tennyson is supposed to be some kind of way, you know, way into poetry. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think finding somebody who is both accessible and also writing things that you might care about um, is really helpful. And for that, I recommend Nick Flynn. Um, he is a mainstream poet. And his, uh, one of his first books called Some Ether is a set of poems that tells about his reaction to his mother's suicide when he was a child. And so it builds together as a narrative so that if you're a narrative reader, it's got that structure for you. Gotcha. Um, so the transition's a little also easier. Is beautiful poetry, yeah. So I feel like the place that I see poetry probably the most is is fan magazines or or even the magazines that accompany the different sci-fi fantasy conventions that that we regularly attend. Uh, what what kind of places or resources would you direct people other than just that one specific poet to kind of find science fiction fantasy poetry out there in the world? Right. Um, well, there's the anthology I just mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a magazine called Stone Telling. Um, there are actually a couple of magazines online, Stone Telling and Goblin Fruit. Uh, Strange Horizons publishes poetry. I feel like uh, those are the main places where I would go to see the science fiction and fantasy. Uh, you know, and a lot of these people actually uh, will publish on their own live journals and their own blogs. Uh, poetry is uh, sometimes thought of as a gift economy. It's not very uh, money driven. You don't make as, as little <laughs> money as you make writing fiction, you make much less writing poetry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, one of my friends who's, who's a, a poet, she got her MFA in poetry in New Mexico, is, makes her money as an editor, not as a poet. It's, you know, you gotta, you gotta find something to, to subsidize it. Now, we don't mean to turn you into a recommendation engine, but we've got some listener <laughs> questions. And the first one uh, from Tamahome wants to know, as a specialist in short stories, how do you find good short stories to read? Well, um, I actually read an enormous a number of short stories every year, or I try to, I may have to skip this year. Um, and uh, so one of the methods that I've used is to read stuff, um, read things that I know I reliably like, which makes sense, right? Yeah, sure. Um, so if I know that, for instance, Ellen Datlow or um, Neil Clark is likely to be editing something that I think is really smart, then seeking out that work is a good place for me to begin. I also do contact writers whose work I really enjoy and ask them what they've produced in a given year. And that's something that I can do because I know most of them, but as somebody who doesn't know most of them, if you go to writers' blogs, especially at this time of year, a lot of them are posting um, a list and, and under the guise of award eligibility, but it's also just to give you, give you an idea of what they've published during the year. Mm. That'll have links of all of the things that they really liked. Um, it's important to find out whose taste you think is smart, and then you can follow them around. 
and and make them do the work gotcha. of finding stories. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Our next question comes from Tyler, and he says, Abomination Rises on Filthy Wings was a strange, disturbing story. What is the thought process when you're writing imagery that can be truly visceral and shocking to the reader? Do you, do you think about how the reader is going to react, or do you even concern yourself with the reaction to your work? Yeah, I read that, that question online. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were prepped for this one? Well, okay, so this particular story um, has a little bit of a story behind it, uh, which is when you're running a horror magazine, you get in slush uh, these stories that some of the slush readers I know call kill the bitch stories. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Which are these yeah. autobiographical, well, you know, pseudo autobiographical. They read like they're somebody's fantasy fulfillment of killing their wife or ex wife. Mm -hmm. Like revenge porn kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And they're really scary and unsettling. And what I wanted to do was write a story in that genre while simultaneously not endorsing that mm -hmm. as an okay thing to be writing about. You know, um, creating the narrative separation that those authors fail to create, right? Um, so that my story would be a kill the bitch story that's not about killing someone, but about the uh, visceral misogyny of the narrator. Mm, okay. And so in that case, I was thinking about the disturbing imagery because um, that is the main character's way of looking at the world. And I got a lot of it from looking at um, uh, manboobs.com and his dissections of men's rights activists um, oh. and the kinds of things they say about women, which are visceral and disturbing. All right, we have a couple of super questions for you. Are you ready? Okay. Uh, first <laughs> I love one. The, I just have to say, I love the reaction all the authors g give when we say it's time for the super questions. They're like, oh, now what? There's a tiny look of trepidation, oh, isn't there? Yeah, always uh, a little often. bit. So, yeah, they're not bad. They're not we that promise. bad, no. Uh, first one is actually pretty fun. If you could ban a word, what word would you ban? Just. You know, I'm going to be a super, uh, like, social justice-y. Uh, I'm just, nobody needs to be using the N-word. Okay. Yeah, All right. Good one. That's a good one. Yeah. I don't think anyone's going to take issue with banning that word either. No. Oh, you have no idea. Oh, uh, you know, <laughs> as soon as I'm, like, halfway through that sentence, I realize I'm totally wrong, but they shouldn't. That's a much better <laughs> word than what my word is. What's your word? Panties. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a terrible word. Panties. Yeah, I, don't I don't even like you saying it. Panties. You probably get a lot of moist. Too. Oh, I know. Oh, that's the word. Then you combine. No, bad. Yep. Bad business. All right. Well, on a happier Power note. cleanser. On a happier <laughs> note, what is your favorite word? Oh, God. How could you choose? <laughs> well, maybe As a not writer, the, this is hard. It doesn't have to be the ultimate favorite word, but pick a favorite word. Something that's been rolling around in your head recently that you like the sound of. Oh, man. This is still a very difficult question. I know. Tasty word, a chewy word. Um, you know, I've, uh, I'm writing a book called Swift Gray Wild, and the, the word gray keeps hanging in my head. And I think that's actually partially because I can't spell it um, because I read too much British writing. Mm, mm -hmm. And so it's become this kind of, uh, I actually see the British spelling and the American spelling as looking like two incredibly different words in my head, which they're not. Huh. Uh, so I don't know if that's my favorite word, but it's an interesting thing about words. I, love, I actually love gray well, as a word. Well, Tom is our resident Anglophile. Oh, please. So you are. So I, I, I can't even remember which is which. Which is oh, the okay. which is E the, is the anglicization. It's the correct way. And then oh, A the is correct, the way the, the Americans way? Oh, OK. Yeah. See, this is, what, this is what I have to deal with all the and time. And the A just looks wrong. I, I agree. I'm with you on that one. It I does. feel like that's more almost a name. G-R-A-Y feels more like a name to me. Mm. I can't really put my, my finger on it. It just has that feeling to me, while G-R-E-Y feels like the color or the shade. I don't know why. Yeah. Interesting. Lady cool. Grey. Lady Grey. Yeah, maybe something like that. I don't mm. know. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us and being on the show today. Thank you for having me. It was great talking to you, Rachel. Uh, her most recent book, How the World Became Quiet, Myths of the Past, Present, and Future, is a collection of her short works and came out September 30th. That's it, folks. If you want more Sword and Laser, there is tons of it. You can join our Goodreads group at goodreads.com and subscribe to the podcast, both audio and video, at swordandlaser.com. We'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Lem, hey Lem, can you get the lights?